Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you for attending this afternoon's program entitled the Revised Penal Code of the Philippines with Bar Questions and Suggested Answer Book 1, Book Launch and Lecture. Before we start, we would like to enjoin everyone to be in the presence of our dear Almighty Father for our opening prayer to be followed shortly by the singing of our national anthem. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Before we proceed, we would like to remind all of you to keep your audio on mute and your video turned off. Again, good afternoon to all of you. I am Carla Bana from Rex Bookstore and I will be your host this afternoon. I hope everyone is safe, healthy, and in good spirits. Now, to officially open today's event, let us hear from Rex Bookstore's Chief External Affairs Officer, Ms. Danta Crimelda Aibuhain for the opening remarks and message from the publisher. Good afternoon, our dear guests. I have the honor to open this afternoon's event and be part of yet another milestone for Rex. Rex Bookstore began in 1950 as a humble bookstore in Escarga, which is now Recto, engaged in the buying and selling of secondhand books. Now, 70 years later, we have grown into an organization providing learners across all ages with learning solutions that allow them to improve the lives and the lives of others. We publish books from pre-elementary, basic education, all the way to college, post-collegiate, and, and, and as you already know, quality law books written by our country's legal luminaries. <clears throat> this afternoon, we shall witness the launch of the very first edition of the Revised Penal Code of the Philippines Code of Provisions, Book 1, with bar questions and suggested answers by Dean Jemmy Lito Fisti. As prefaced, this book is, in a way, an innovative approach for a better understanding of criminal law. Rather than choosing to publish the naked, raw, codal provision of the Revised Penal Code, the author deemed it, it's wise to incorporate related bar questions with suggested answers to every particular provision of the law designed for easy recall and comprehension of otherwise intricate, complex, 
and sometimes confusing concepts and principles of criminal law. In addition, this book indicates how many times a particular provision of the RPC is asked in the bar examination, thereby helping law students study wisely by concentrating on the more important topics given their limited time of studying. Written in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic, this book is but a representation of resiliency, perseverance, and traits that are highly essential in the pursuit of the study of law. Allow me to formally introduce the great man behind this feat, an author of several best-selling law books. He obtained his Master of Laws from San Sebastian College Recoletos, where he was conferred with recognition, Beni Meritus. He's currently the Secretary General of the Philippine Association of Law Schools, or PAWS. He's also the chairholder of the Chief Justice Panganiban Professional Chairs on Liberty and Prosperity Foundation on Liberty and Prosperity. A seasoned law professor, bar reviewer of an MCLE lecturer. He's currently the bar director of the PUP Bar Review Center and the dean of the Polytechnic University of the Philippines College of Law. And of course, a very, very, very good friend of ours. He's indeed truly a gem in the field of legal education. Friends, let us all welcome Dean Hemi Lito Festi. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Ms. Danda Buay. Good afternoon, so, uh, Our uh, Rex Bookstore team, our esteemed guests, uh, friends, students, viewers, and to everyone. Uh, first of all, allow me to uh, extend my felicitations to Rex Bookstore in supporting this humble and the work by coming up with the idea of having a virtual book launching of this book I authored entitled The Revised Penal Code of the Philippines, Codal Provisions with Bar Questions and Suggested Answers book. Now, many complain of, uh, about how difficult it is to understand criminal law. This statement I often hear, mostly from freshman law students, as well as bar reviewers. This assertion is absolutely true if one is to rely only on the naked draw or codal provisions of criminal law. And if, even if one is to read an annotated criminal law book, what is the guarantee that one can easily comprehend concepts like Mala inse or mala prohibita, complex crime, the triple rule, or the principle of nulem crimen, nulem puenes uh, NLA, or the nomenclature of penalties like reclusion temporal, prison mayor, prison correctional, in relation to imposition of penalties. These concepts must not only be explained but illustrated. What better way for them to understand criminal law but to illustrate it by providing them with previous part questions with suggested answers? And why not provide them with materials that will be a ro roadmap on how to review criminal law and how to present their answers? Uh, this book, in a way, answers that call. It is an innovative approach for a better understanding of uh, criminal law. As mentioned by uh, Ms. Danda, rather than uh, choosing to publish the uh, raw uh, provisions of the revised penal code, it is deemed uh, wise to incorporate uh, part questions with suggested answers to every particular uh, provision of the law designed for easy recall and comprehension of otherwise an intricate or complex or sometimes confusing uh, principles of criminal law. So immediately after reading a particular article of the revised uh, penal code, students will be able to know how bar questions are framed based on that specific topic. In addition, this book indicates how many times a particular provision of the revised penal code is asked in the bar examinations. So by doing so, the students and bar examinees will be able to know which subject matter are commonly and not so commonly asked. This way, they will be able to study wisely by concentrating on the more important topics 
given give their limited sign of study. Lastly, they will be able to learn how the answers are to be logically presented. Uh, as mentioned again by Ms. Danda, this book was actually written in the midst of the uh, COVID pandemic during the so-called general community quarantine. But life must go on. And despite the uncertainties and challenges of the time, our journey towards the fulfillment of our vision must never stop. We are reminded of an event in the Holy Scripture where some, some men were sent by Moses to spy on the land promised by God to them. When they returned, some of them were afraid to conquer the, ter the, the territory and even said, and I quote, we are not able uh, to go up against these people for they are stronger than we are. The land that we have gone to as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants and the people we saw in it are of great size and to our ourselves we seem like grasshoppers and so we seem to them. But two men named uh, Caleb and Joshua reported to Moses to go up at once and occupy the land that they are well able to overcome. They declared, the land that we went through as spies is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us as a land flowing with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land for they are not no more than bread for us. Their protection is removed from them and the Lord with us do not fear them. To make uh, the story short, Joshua and Caleb were able to enter and conquer the land because they believe they can. The others did not because they did not believe that they are able to do it. The famous uh, Amer Austrian neurologist and uh, psychiatrist, Viktor Frankl, a Holocaust survivor, in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, aptly said, everything can be taken from man but one thing, the loss of the human freedom to choose one's attitude in any uh, given set of circumstances to choose one's own way. He explained that uh, between the stimulus and that of the response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. So be encouraged. Now permit me to lecture on certain uh, salient features of uh, criminal law, book one. Now, uh, we start with the definition of what is criminal law. Criminal law is defined as, uh, criminal law should be, uh, it defines crime. Traits of its nature. and it provides punishment. So not every law which seem, which seem like a, a penal law is not a criminal law, strictly speaking. In order for a law to be considered as criminal or penal law, it should define a crime, it treats of its nature and provides punishment. What is the significance? If it is a criminal law, then it is entitled to what kind of interpretation? If there is doubt as to or ambiguity as to the interpretation of a penal law, it should be interpreted in favor of the accused and strictly against the government. So if it is a penal law, it is entitled to this uh, interpretation in case of ambiguity or doubt. Now, if it is not a penal law, then it is not entitled to this uh, interpretation unless that specific law provides otherwise. Okay, uh, Congress is just a creation of uh, 
the our constitution. So it cannot enact a law that runs counter to the provisions of our fundamental law, which is the constitution. So we have constitutional limitations like due process, okay? That this must be given an opportunity to be heard, opportunity to air inside. Okay, we have the bill of container, we have the ex, ex post facto law, in which the law must be prospectively applied. Of course, uh, there is also a presumption of innocence. So all accused are presumed to be innocent unless proven otherwise. So this is the presumption of innocence. Of course, this is just a presumption which can be rebutted. But what quantum of evidence to rebut that presumption of innocence? By proof beyond reasonable doubt. So if the prosecution can adduce evidence, okay, uh, which is the quantum of evidence of, uh, of proof is uh, proof beyond reasonable doubt, it can destroy already the presumption of innocence. Okay, but if they are not unable to adduce a quantum of evidence by proof beyond reasonable doubt, then that presumption stands. Of course, there is a right to counsel and there is a right to be informed of the nature of the cause of accusation against him. Okay. Um, and this is done during arraignment. Now we go to characteristics of criminal law. Okay. Let me share my whiteboard screen. Okay, characteristics of criminal law. So we have the general. The first one is the general. First, there is also the territorial as well as the um, perspectivity. Let's discuss general. Now, most of the students interchange or get confused with the general characteristic with that of the territorial. Territorial general refers to persons. Okay, so you, you start with all persons. When you talk about the territorial rule, it speaks about the place in general it speaks about persons so all persons okay who live or sojourn in the philippines are subject to our own criminal law no so they cannot uh, raise as a matter of defense their national law okay because they live or even just visiting the philippines are subject to the Philippine criminal court proceedings. So they cannot just say that uh, in their uh, in the state that uh, they belong, it is uh, uh, lawful to possess marijuana. But if you're in the Philippines, it is not. So you have to abide by our rules. Now, uh, this rule is not uh, an absolute rule. There are exceptions. Number one exception is loss of preferential application. Preferential application. What does it mean? The, the law gives preference to a particular class of person, such that if that person belongs to that class of persons, then he is not covered by our criminal law. So under public international law, we've got uh, the sovereigns, okay? the heads of the state, the ambassadors, ministers, plenipotentiary, ministers, residents, and charge the affairs, okay? They are not covered, even if they are in the Philippines. Now, what about uh, domestic servants? Domest under Republic Act 75, uh, domestic servants of an accredited ambassadors in the performance of their duties and functions or they are now also not covered. Let's go to territoriality or the territorial group. Okay, it talks about a subset place. So all crimes, the general rule, okay, all crimes committed within Okay, within the Philippine territory is subject to our Philippine 
the criminal law. So all crimes, therefore, okay, which are outside the Philippines, then uh, Philippine uh, courts have no jurisdiction to try the case. So it's very clear, for as long as the crimes are committed within the Philippine territory, Philippine courts uh, can exercise criminal jurisdiction over the act. But all crimes committed outside the Philippine territory, Philippine courts uh, have no jurisdiction to try the case. Is that, an, uh, is that an absolute rule? No, there are exceptions. Exceptions meaning to say that although the crime is committed outside the Philippine territory, yet Philippine courts still have jurisdiction to try the case. Okay, we call it extraterritorial application two. So they are enumerated under Article Two of the Revised Penal Code. Number one, he should commit an offense while on a Philippine ship or airship. So how do you know that it is a Philippine ship or airship? It does not depend upon the nationality of the owner of the vessel. It does not depend upon also the, the nationality of the parties involved, the complainant as well as the victim. You consider it a Philippine ship or airship it is, if it is registered in the Philippines, particularly with uh, the Bureau of Customs. The second is should forge or counterfeit any coin or currency notes or obligations or securities issued by the Philippine government. So it refers to a forger. Even if the crime is committed, say for example, in Singapore, within the territory of another state, and even if it is committed, if the crime, if the act of forging is committed also in Singapore, but if it concerns our coin and currency notes or obligations and securities, they can be tried in the Philippines for such act. The third is, uh, it should be liable for the introduction of the obligations and securities mentioned on the previous section. This refers to a smuggler. If they smuggle the obligation and securities issued by the Philippine government, okay, if they, if they uh, smuggle it, even if they exchange hands in the high seas, together with the Filipino, to meet the Filipino counterpart smuggler, they can also be liable. Fourth is a public officer who commits a crime okay, in the discharge or related to his uh, functions or duties. Now, you have to remember that it does not follow that just because a crime is committed by a public officer outside the Philippines, it's a facto, Okay, automatically, we have jurisdiction to try the case. No, it must have some relevance in the performance of her due of his or her duties and responsibilities. So, if the public officer who commits a crime, okay, of malversation, is a disbursing officer, then that is a related related to his uh, duties and responsibilities or function, and he can be tried. Okay in the Philippines, even though the crime committed is outside the Philippines. Number five, should, be should uh, commit against a crime against national security and the law of nations. Now, this, is, this gets confusing to others. So assuming that you are, that this is the Philippines, okay? This is the territory of the, the, territory of the Philippines and one is A and B are in Hong Kong, A okay, and B. They purchase arms, okay, to support. Assuming lang, assuming that there is rebellion in the Philippines, okay, they, uh, there's some, uh, group of men who are taking arms against the government, 
okay, and uh, intending to overthrow the government, and they are the ones uh, supporting the same. Okay, um, when they went back to the Philippines, they were prosecuted. Okay, now they claim, of course, that since the crime is committed outside the Philippine territory, then uh, we, ha we have no jurisdiction to try the case. Prosecution contends that they should be tried in the Philippines. So what is the answer? Okay, would their acts be deemed as a crime against national security or the law of nations? Okay, so they were charged by the prosecution for rebellion. Can they be charged of re uh, rebellion? Would the rebellion prosper? Is, is it a law against national security? It is not. Rebellion is a crime against public order. Ergo, Philippine courts have no jurisdiction to try the case. Okay, the exception will not apply. The general rule will apply that crimes committed outside the Philippine territory. Okay, uh, Philippine courts have no jurisdiction to try the case. Okay, remember that uh, crimes against national security would be treason, misprision of treason, espionage, violation of neutrality, or uh, piracy would be a law against uh, uh, law of nations, or humanity. So the thing is that you've got to memorize what are those, those crimes against national security and the law of nations. So okay. Now we go to felonies, Article 3. felony. Acts or omissions punishable by the revised penal code are called felonies. So crimes committed, okay, in violation of a special penal law cannot be uh, considered as a felony. It is only an offense or a crime in general. So you've got to determine, let me just go back on the difference between crimes punished under the revised penal code from that of special penal law. As, uh, aside from uh, crimes committed are called as uh, felonies in the RPC. Crimes committed under the RPC are called to be mala in se. When you talk about mala in se, it is evil in its nature. SPL, like uh, murder, okay? homicide, robbery. SPL, it is mala prohibita. Not necessarily evil, but uh, it is a crime because there is a law that uh, prohibits the performance of a particular act and the offender voluntarily okay, violates the same. Like illegal possession of firearms, it is ma not mala in say. It is not evil in its nature. But since um, in, the, in our jurisdiction, okay, possession of uh, firearms is illegal as a general rule and then as there's a license and if someone violates the same, it is deemed as mala prohibita. Now since mala in say, since RPs, but not, remember not, not all crimes against RPC, okay, uh, uh, punishable under the RPC is they are deemed as mala in say. There is one also which is deemed as mala prohibita, although it's an RPC. It's technical malversation. Technical malversation when there is a law okay, that, uh, that allocates uh, a public fund for a particular purpose. And that public fund okay, was used for another public purpose other than to which the law or the ordinance intended it to be used. So is good faith uh, a proper defense in technical malversation? No, it's because it's mala prohibita. Okay, because in mala in mala in se, it uh, good faith is a proper defense. So if a person is, char is charged of murder, you can raise good faith. It is only an act of self-preservation, self-defense. Okay, what about in SPL? Mala prohibita. But this, there are also exceptions. One would be plunder. Plunder is punished under special penal law. 
but it is deemed as bala in sin. So therefore, good faith is a proper defense. Okay, so but the uh, general rule, SPL, malabru kita is uh, good faith is not a defense. What else? The stages of execution. Which are the consummated, frustrated, and attempted. They are determined in RPC, crime Spanish under the RPC, in order to arrive at the proper penalty to be imposed. In SPL, no need because the crime is deemed to be dead in a consummated stage. And there is a specific penalty provided for by special penal. Although there are some uh, SPL that uses the stages of execution. But generally, okay, it has those stages of execution because it is deemed, the act is deemed to be committed on a consummated stage. Persons criminally li liable. Who are they? The principals, accomplices, accessories. We determine that in crime Spanish under the RPC. Why? To arrive at the proper imposition of the penalty. In SPL, okay, the offender is deemed to be a principal, no accessories, no accomplices, generally. Although there are some crimes which adopt this person's criminally liable, like in, uh, in the anti-terrorism law, okay, there are uh, that persons liable expressly therein are principals, accomplices, and accessories. So they, uh, Okay, how do we determine it? Because in consummated, frustrated, and attempted, and uh, principal, accomplice, accessories, uh, in book two, crimes, uh, crimes committed under book two, specific crimes, are deemed imposed upon a principal on a consummated stage. But if it is frustrated, stage and not consummated, it is one degree lower than that imposed upon a principal on a consummated stage. If it is in attempted, it's two degrees lower than that imposed upon a principal on a consummated stage. Now, if it is committed by an accomplice, it's one degree lower than that imposed again upon a principal on a consummated stage. Accessories, two degrees lower than that imposed upon a principal on a consummated stage. So remember that. That's why it's significant in RPC. We determine that because uh, it's uh, entitled to a lessening of one or two degrees lower. And we, we talk about degrees, we talk about the nomenclature of penalties under the revised penal code, like reclusion perpetua, reclusion temporal, prison mayor, prison correctional, arresto mayor, arresto menor. Now, what else? The uh, appreciation of mitigating and aggravating circumstances. We appreciate that in order, again, to arrive at the proper penalty to be imposed. So ordinary mitigating as against generic aggravating, we offset each other to determine the proper period to be imposed, whether it's minimum, medium, or maximum period. Okay, so it refers to rule of uh, offsetting in a divisible penalty. But in uh, special penal laws, wala silang ganon. Okay, uh, we do not appreciate the presence of mitigating and aggravating circumstances okay, in order to arrive at the proper penalty to be imposed. Also, last, the nomenclature of penalties. As I mentioned a while ago, you've got reclusion perpetua down to arrest of menor. But in SPL, okay, they give specific penalty. They, it does not use the nomenclature of penalties anymore of the RPC. So there's a one bar question, uh, differentiate uh, the crimes punished under the RPC, uh, reclusion perpetua from life imprisonment. Reclusion perpetua is a penalty imposed under the revised penal code. It has a duration of 20 years, one day to 40 years. Life imprisonment, okay, is, is uh, imposed 
where the uh, crime committed is punished under a special penal law. And it has no duration, just like that of the future perpetua. But, but, last, okay, there are instances where the nomenclature of penalties are adopted or borrowed under the special penal laws. So even if it's an SPL, it uses the nomenclature of penalties under the revised penal code. That is why when we arrive, when we compute the proper penalty to be imposed under the indeterminate uh, sentence law, the formula, the rules that we're going to use, will that, will that be of the RPC and not that of the special penal law? Okay. So let's go back to uh, felonies. Felonies, they are divided into two. You've got dolo and culpa. Elements of dolo, you got freedom, you have intelligence, and you've got criminal intent. Okay, well, synonymous also to evil motive acting in bad faith or malice. It connotes evil intent also bad faith and malice. In culpa, the elements are freedom, intelligence, impudence, negligence, lack of foresight, and lack of skill. Impudence connotes what? Deficiency of action, negligence, uh, connotes deficiency of perception. Now, if you are the prosecutor, you've got to prove the elements of uh, dolo. Like if it's murder, so you've got to prove there's freedom, there's intelligence, there's freedom. Okay. Now, if you are the counsel for the accused, okay, remove any of those elements, then your, your client will be acquitted. So how do you negate freedom? Okay, how do you negate freedom? By proving what? Irresistible force. Irresistible force is an exempting circumstance under Article 12 or, of the Revised Penal Code. Intelligence. Okay, you prove that your client is 15 years old or under. Total exemption from criminal liability. Now, if your client is 16 years old, but below 18, you prove that he is. Uh, acting without discernment that he does, does not know right from wrong okay so if how do you negate uh, intent if you are the defense counsel okay now if criminal intent connotes bad faith what's the opposite of uh, bad faith good faith good faith negates criminal intent Okay. Now, culpa, they have the same element except the third one. Now, the question is, would good faith be a proper defense to culpa? The answer is no. A person may be acting in good faith, but he can still be negligent. He can still be negligent because he may be overspeeding, in which case he is uh, criminally liable. Okay, the case of Achom is that oh, in Dolo, there must be mens rea and actus rea. Criminal mind and criminal act. Those two must go hand in hand. So in the case of uh, Achong, there is no mens rea because he was only uh, performing a lawful act. Okay, so yung U.S. versus Achong. It raises the noble defense of mistake of fact, which is not the same as that of mistake in identity. Mistake of fact. Okay, somebody was not, uh, Achong was uh, sleeping. Okay, he had a roommate and okay, uh, crime was prevalent in their, neighbor, in their neighborhood at that time. 
So when somebody was banging on the door and he was asking, who are you? But the answer, but uh, the question left unanswered. Eventually that person was able to get in and uh, Achong thinking that his life is in danger, stopped and killed this person. It turned out that it was his roommate playing a joke on him. Okay. He raised this mistake of fact as a matter of defense. And he was equipped, uh, acquitted because of that. And these are the requisites. Okay. The act would have been lawful. His act of stabbing okay, his roommate would have been lawful had the facts been as the accused believe it to be. It is that if that person is really an intruder, then his act of stabbing him would be lawful. Next, intent is also lawful. He is only what? Defending himself. And lastly, there is uh, no carelessness or without carelessness on his part or negligence. He verified the identity of the person by asking, who are you? But the question was left unanswered. So if these three are present, there, there is no criminal liability because there is no criminal liability. Let's go to Article 4. How criminal liability is incurred. Criminal liability is incurred in two ways. Number one, by committing a felony. Although the wrongful act done be different from that which he intended. So there is a wrongful act done which was committed and however, the resulting injury is different from that of which he intended. Now, is this felony applicable also to uh, all types of felony like dolo and culpa? No, it is not applicable to not NA to culpa. Why? You can sense it already because of the provision of the law which states there, there that although the wrongful act done be different from that which is intended. So there is intentional felony. So this is applicable only to intentional felony. So not applicable to negligent act. Not, not also applicable if the crime committed is an SPL or punished under special penal laws. Not applicable also if one is performing a lawful act, okay? So one who is uh, committing an intentional felony is liable for the direct, natural, and logical consequences of his unlawful act, liable also for the resulting injury. Okay, the resulting injury is the direct, natural, and logical consequences of his unlawful intentional act, then uh, Article 4, Paragraph 1 finds application. Although the resulting injury, again, will be different from that which he intended. So Article 4, uh, Paragraph 1 speaks about proximate cause also. And proximate cause is based on the principle that he is, we, he is the cause of the cause, is the cause of the even cause. So say, for example, that uh, X is a passenger of this jeepney and Robber one and robber two went inside the passenger uh, jeepney and declared a hold up. So they were amassing all these personal properties from some of the passengers. When X okay, uh, was fearful for the actuations of R1 and R2, 
So he jumped out of the passenger jeep. Unfortunately, he, okay, her head hit the pavement of the street and she died. The prosecution filed the case against R1 and R2. And the prosecution also states that uh, they're also liable for the death of X. Now, R1 and R2 contends that they are not liable for her death because they did not kill her. It was her, her voluntary act. That's why she went out of the passenger uh, jeep. Okay? And the question is, is the argument raised by R1 and R2 credible or no good or correct? No, because of the principle of proximate cause. Because of Article 4, Paragraph 1, in saying that uh, a felony is committed although the wrongful act done be, di be different from that which he intended. Okay, so were it not for the, uh, the actuations of R1 and R2, in declaring a hold up and in uh, obtaining all those uh, pers personal properties of the other passengers, X would not have jumped out of the passenger uh, jeep. She only jumped because she was fearful for her life. Okay. Of course, it also gives, applies the error in person A, which is mistake of in identity notice that in all these instances uh, mistake in the blue mistake in identity greater intention and there is criminal intent so if a intended to kill b and he planned to kill b waited for b to walk in the street at night because he knew he knows at the time that after work he would pass by the street stop this person it turned out that it was another person c okay is a is uh, a liable for the death of c sabi niya hindi it's because uh that's only my negligent act i have no intention to kill c would the argument be uh, tenable no because at the onset when he waited for b there is intent to kill already intentional felony Second is a uh, mistake in the blow. Or aberratio ictus. This is characterized class. You have to remember that a magic uh, words then would be lack of precision. Lack of precision. So if A intended to kill B, because of lack of precision, the bullet ricochet and hit another person. So how many people are present at the scene of the crime in mistake in the blow? There are three, A, B, and C. What about in error in person A? Two only, A and C. But A believed that C, when he committed the crime, is B, and actually another person. So remember that. So mistake in the blow may even re, uh, result to complex crime under Article 48 of the Revised Penal Code, assuming that the single act produces two or more grave or less grave felonies. Assuming that uh, those two are present, then it will lead into uh, complex crime. The th third one is the injury is... Uh, Injury is greater than the intent. The resulting injury is greater than the intent or greater intention. So if A only intended to slap B because the slap was so strong, B fell down. Again, he said hitting the pavement of the street and B died. The intent to slap uh, the injury sustained by B, which is death, is greater than that intent of A, which is only to slap the face of B. This is a mitigating circumstance of uh, under Article 13, lack of intent to, to commit safe, so grave or wrong. Let's go to the second, uh, we still have uh, uh, 
10 minutes before we go into bird questions. Let's go to impossible crime. Paragraph 2 speaks about impossible crime. Paragraph 2, Article 4 speaks that, uh, provides that by performing an act which would be again, a, which will be a crime against persons or property were it not for its inherent impossibility or the count of employment of inadequate and in effectual means okay so the crime is not committed okay there there are also other uh elements which are not present in the codal provision uh the act would must not be uh punish under other provision of the RPC. If that act is already punished under other provision of the RPC, then there is no impossible crime anymore. And of course, there is evil intent. Okay, let's discuss this one by one. Impossible crime okay, is only limited to crimes against persons and property. So the moral lesson there is to memorize what are those crimes against persons and property. So murder, homicide, physical injuries, among others. Property would be robbery, theft, estafa, malicious escape, among others. What about kidnapping? They kidnap the wrong person. Is that a crime against person? No. It is a crime classified as a crime against personal liberty. So it's not applicable. Inherent impossibility. It is not susceptible of being consummated because it is inherently impossible. So there is all there is uh, legal, there is physical impossibility. There is also legal impossibility. Physical impossibility. Can you kill a person who's already dead? No. Why? Because it's led dead. So A uh, intended to kill B. But unknown to A, B already suffered a uh, heart attack an hour earlier. So A all along, all along thought that B was only sleeping. Stop B. A is there impossible, right? Yes. Because uh, A believed at that time that B was alive, but in truth and in fact, he's already dead. If he knew at that time, and this is the trick in the bar. If he knew at the time that he was already dead, it's still uh, stab him, then impossible crime is not applicable. Employment of inadequate or ineffectual means. So A intended to kill B, believing, and he put a poison in the cup to be given to B, believing that this volume is enough to kill the other person. But unknown to him, the volume is, must be this much. Okay? So if he knew at that time that the volume is not adequate to kill uh, B, then forget about the application of impossible crime. Employment of ineffectual means. A intended to, uh, uh, if one intended to kill B by using a poison and he put a substance in therein, believing that it was poison, were included in fact and unknown to him, okay, it's only sugar. So employment or of ineffectual means. Of course, the act should not be punished under other provision of the RPC. So if A intended to kill B by burning the house of B, but unknown to A, B already left the house a week earlier, he went to Metro Mani to Manila, assuming this happened in the province, and A burned the house of B, believing that B was present and B did that die because he was in Manila. That's impossible. There is no impossible crime. Why? Because that act is punished under other provision of the revised penal code, which is the crime of arson. 
Now, in impossible crime, objectively, there's no crime, but subjectively, there is uh, uh, crime to be read to address also the criminal uh, propensity of uh, the perpetrator. So there's a specific penalty provided for uh, by the RPC in impossible crime. Okay, so uh, the last topic before we go into the code of provision uh, at the bar examination, we go into stages of execution. But prior to that, okay, the development of a crime, internal acts, and external acts. External acts, we've got preparatory acts and acts of execution. Question, are internal acts punishable? No. You can think of any crime for as long as it stays in your mind and there's no overt act. So, no criminal ability. And it's absolute. Okay, no uh, exception. What about external acts? We go to preparatory acts. Are preparatory acts punishable? Okay, uh, as a rule, preparatory acts are not punishable unless there is a law that already punishes that particular act. If the, if that act is not punished under other provision of the RPC, it's not punishable. So if one intends to kill another person by using insecticide, uh, siguro, you will place that in, 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 in the food, then there is no crime committed because buying insecticide is not uh, punishable. But if one intends to rob another person, and he was to do that, he was in possession of pick locks, then he will be, that is punishable already. Legal possession of pick locks. But not liable for attempted robbery because this is just a preparatory act. Okay, when you talk about acts of ex execution, you're talking about consummated, who stated, as well as attempted stages of execution in which there is criminal liability. So attempted. Attempted is that he commences, look at your codal provision, he commences the commission of a felony directly by overt act. And he does not perform all acts of execution which will produce the felony. In other words, the crime is not consummated. So why is it not consummated? The reason is that for reasons or accidents other than his spontaneous resistance. Spontaneous resistance is material in the attempted state. If there's spontaneous resistance, there is no attempted felony. Okay? And these are the requisites. So if A intended to kill B, and he pointed his gun on the person of B, but uh, he had a sudden change of heart, he desisted and walked away, then he's not liable for attempted homicide or murder as the case may be. Why? because there is spontaneous resistance. Spontaneous resistance is appreciated because it is a form of a reward given by the state for a person who, at the break of committing a crime, he the call of his conscience and return to the path of righteousness. Okay? So not liable for attempted, but will he be liable for any act? Yes. He will be liable only for grave threat because uh, the act of pointing a gun on the person of B already constitutes the crime of uh, attempt of great threat. Now, if A, second scenario, if A 
uh, pointed the gun on the person of B and uh, he shot B actually, but only B suffered slight physical injuries. Okay, uh, the one hit is only uh, his finger and it is not a mortal wound. Would you say that it is attempted? Yes, it is attempted. Okay, so let's go into the elements of the crime. Did he perform all acts of ex Did he commence the commission of a felony by directly by overt act? Yes, he pointed his gun on the person of B. Okay, uh, did he or did he not perform all acts of execution? He actually shot B, but it was not a mortal wound. If A lives, then B would survive. So that means there's still another shot, okay, uh, needed to kill B. So in essence, it means that he was not, he was not able to perform all acts of execution. If the wound is not a mortal wound, then it could be attempted. Okay. Why? If the wound is uh, mortal, it may be frustrated. Because in frustrated, the elements is that he already performed okay, all acts of all acts of execution which would produce the felony. But it was not produced. Okay, not produced. Why? Is it other than spontaneous resistance? No. Okay, independent of the will of the perpetrator or in the independent of the will of the accused meaning the crime was not consummated and the offender has no, nothing to do with it so if a shot if uh, a shot b and b suffered a mortal wound okay Siguro what was uh, hit was his heart, his intestine, his kidney, and a walk away, believing that there's nothing more to be done because he was already dying. But when A left, okay, C saw what happened to B. And C is a, was a good Samaritan and uh, he brought B to the hospital. And because of timely medical attention, KB survived. So did he perform all acts of execution which would produce the felony on the person of B? Yes, because it is a mortal wound. Okay, did it did did it did the B die? No, the felony. So it shows you that you have to master this provision of the law. So what is good in this are uh Udal, in this in my book is that it has indication of how many times this was asked in the bar exam. This one. Okay. So let's uh let's uh, look on the next uh question. Okay, Ando, an Indonesian national who just visited the Philippines, purchased a ticket for passenger vessel bound for Hong Kong. Say it's uh, the person here is Ando, Indonesian. Yeah, okay. Visited the Philippines, purchased a ticket bound for uh, Hong Kong. So ticket, so he's now in the vessel bound for Hong Kong. And while on board the vessel, he saw his mortal enemy, Jason, also an Indonesian national, seated at the back portion of the cabin and who was busy reading a newspaper. So Ando stealthily approached Jason and he, when he was near him, Ando stopped and killed. So these are material facts. Ando stabbed and killed Jason. 
So he killed Jason. That's um, the kind of people he said. The vessel is registered in uh, Malaysia. So his vessel is in Malaysia. Registered in Malaysia. The killing happened just a few moments. And this is the trick. The killing happened just a few moments after the vessel left the port of Manila. It just left a moments after the vessel left port of Manila. So although the vessel is registered in Malaysia, the venue or where the crime is committed is still within the Philippine territory. So subsequently, operatives from the PNT Maritime uh, Command arrested a law presented the killing of Jason also contend, on the contended that he did not incur criminal liability because number one, okay, he was asserting that uh, he's an Indone Indonesian and that the vessel is registered in Malaysia. So discuss the merits of Ando's contention. So got to remember class always the question that is asked discuss the merits of Anu's contention. So you have to address the first and the second contention of Ando. So what do you remember in this case? The territoriality rule. That if the crime is committed within the Philippine territory, then we have jurisdiction to try the case, except when the vessel is outside. Now where is the vessel? Is it outside? or uh, within the territory of the Philippines. It is within the territory of the Philippines. So the exception uh, would not set in. So it has no bearing whether the vessel is registered in Malaysia simply because the venue of the crime is within the Philippine territory. Okay, does it uh, matter if it's an Indonesian? No. If the national law bears no significance in criminal cases because it is if the crime happens within the Philippine territory. Okay. So let's uh, let's look at the suggested answer. Now, class, whenever you have, uh, whenever you you answer you should be guided by reply legal basis application and conclusion as much as possible kung if there's uh, you can conclude or otherwise at least the legal basis reply or the response or your legal basis as well as the application so sabi the question asked for Discuss the merit of Andos Andos contention. So, okay, you have to face it squarely. So you need to respond or to reply. And those contentions have no merits. Number two, I said legal basis. Legal basis. We discussed the territoriality group. Okay, uh, provides that guns committed within the Philippine territory are subject to extreme of jurisdiction. Okay. The application in this case, the crime was committed inside the Philippine territory. Then our criminal courts have jurisdiction to try to hear the case. Continuation: It is of no moment that the victims are foreigner, since as a rule, their national law is not applicable in criminal cases. So that's a, that's his contention, Nima. That is uh, Indonesia. Okay, number two. Uh, whether it's a Malaysian registered vessel has to also bearing because it happened a few moments after the vessel left the port of Manila, still implying that it is within the Philippine territory. So consequently, Ando may be prosecuted in Manila, in the Philippines. Okay. So let's have an example. Article 3, what does it suggest? Tingnan nyo Article 3. Okay, Article 3, how many times they were asked in the bar, 
what does it tell you? It tells you that you have to study and master article three. Okay. So these are the codal provisions. And look at the bar question. This is basic question. Okay. You have to that this explains why you need to memorize uh, at least articles one to twenty in book one. How are felonies committed? This is your answer, the article. Felonies are committed not only by the citizen, no? and it's also dollar. So there's no excuse why this answer you cannot, this question you cannot answer. Okay, next. We discussed Article 4. Look at Article 4. How many times was it asked in the bar exam? Look. Last year, the other year, then 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Look at that. Okay, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So you have better put a star when it comes to Article 4. That explains why. Uh, I lecture so much on Article 4. Look, this, this point distinguish the following terms. Adaratio equals error of person A, greater intention. I discussed that already a while ago, and it's already, it's only basic. Perhaps last question. Okay. Let's look. Um, on, we, on his way home, on his way home uh, from the office, ZZ rode a jeepney. Subsequently, X, X boarded the same jeepney. Well, upon reaching a secluded spot in Quezon City, X, X pulled a, out a grenade from his uh, bag and announced a whole time. He told ZZ to surrender watch wallet and cell phone and fearful for his life uh, he dizzy jumped out of the window but as he fell he said hit the pavement causing his instant death is dizzy uh, liable for Zizi's death explained fully so this is similar to the illustration that i gave you a while ago so how will you answer this one okay um Okay, I told you, number one is reply. Okay, this is just my advice. No? This is my advice. Okay, uh, is XX liable for this is that? Respond. XX is uh, criminally liable for the death of this. X, Z, and Z. If you want, you can uh, put it, put this sentence after the first sentence. Or you can say, yes, XX is criminally liable for the death of CC because Article 4, Paragraph 1 states that criminal shall, liability, liability shall be incurred although by, by a person committing a felony, although the wrongful act done be different from that which he intended. Okay? And you can also add uh, the principle of proximate cause. Approximate cause. Article 4, paragraph 1 speaks about approximate cause. Okay, let's go there. So we have the legal basis already. Now we go to application. So in the facts given, in the given case, okay, XX committed a felonious act when he pulled out a grenade and declared a hold up, okay, created an immediate sense of danger in the mind of. CC. You can also uh, bring this down to application two. You can state that uh, the actuations of uh, the accused okay, is the pro are the proximate cause of the death of uh, the victim in this case. Their actuations would be deemed as the proximate cause of the death of the victim in this case. 
So you can trace already the conclusion. Consequently, the death of CC caused by fear from XX apps makes the latter criminally liable. Okay, uh, if you still have time, you make a conclusion. Okay, by only rewarding your reply. But the most important here is the reply, the legal basis, as well as the application. Okay, so I think I don't have much time. Uh, thank you very much, uh, um, Flex Bookstore, again, for the opportunity that you've uh, given me. And I uh, wish everyone good luck and keep safe and hoping that all of you will become uh, future lawyers. Thank you very much. Thank you for that very presentation, Dean Festin. Thank you. We are very honored to receive such expert guidance, especially at a time when the and practice of law have become more challenging. Tell us more about how the book can be of great help. We will now listen to expert testimonials. We begin now with no other than Dean Tony Lavina of Ateneo Graduate School. to um, encourage uh, and endorse to everyone, and that is to law students, first year law students taking up criminal law, fourth year law students taking criminal law review, those who have finished already their law school and now are going to take the bar in 2021 and need to review criminal law properly. And I would say even those who are practitioners who need something solid about, uh, about criminal law. I would endorse this book, this latest book by uh, Dean uh, Jeremy Festin of uh, the Polytechnic University of the Philippines College of Law, Penal Code of the Philippine Penal Code of the Philippines, Codal uh, Provisions. Uh, it breaks down the Codal Provisions in a very clear, comprehensive, but also concise uh, way. It includes uh, information about how uh, the bar exams have approached this particular particular articles. Uh, uh, number of questions that have been asked about this article. And those questions are actually uh, replicated uh, with suggested answers uh, provided by by Dean Festine. I would have wanted to have this uh, resource uh, uh, when I was taking up my bar exams um, many years ago, or when I was teaching criminal law uh, in UP, in the University of the Philippines, uh, uh, in my first years as a as a law uh, professor, because uh, you know, in the end, uh, the, the the bar exam in particular is 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 really about the mastery of codal uh, uh, provisions. I mean, cases are good, but but uh, memorizing and and understanding and linking provisions to each other is really important. Um, and having um, a ready-made uh, resource for uh, bar questions in criminal law and arrange according also to the articles and indicating how much they've been, how many times they've been asked and having the suggested answers will also be very uh, good resource for, for all law students, all bar takers, and yes, all practitioners. Thank you, Rex Bookstore, for publishing this uh, important uh, 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 book and important resource for all of us. Maraming salamat. And now, to tell us more about how the book came about the product of expert study and research, let us all hear from the number one bar top naturalist to top for examinations, Attorney Judy Lardizabal. Congratulations, Dean Gemelito Festin, for your new book, Revised Penal Code with Bar Questions and Suggested Answers, Book One. 
your book has been written with the interest of all aspiring lawyers in mind. It is reader-friendly, it is presented based on codal provisions, and supported by past bar examinations and suggested answers. Your book is a must-have for all law students and bar reviewers. Not only will it help them understand the provisions of book one better, it will also give them an idea of uh, the provisions which are considered to be bar exam favorites based on the frequency of their inclusions in the past bar examinations. I highly recommend your book to all of those students and those who are reviewing for the bar. Again, Dean, congratulations for another fascinating work. More power and God bless you. And now, for the back for the next book testimonial, let us all hear it from Miss Mary Abigail B. Modales, Juris Doctor Student. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending this virtual book launch. I am Mary Abigail Modales, currently a first year student at the PUP College of Law. And I've been given this beautiful opportunity to represent the student sector and give a short review on Dean Festing's new book, The Revised Penal Code, complete with codal provisions, bar questions, and suggested answers. So I'd like to start this short review by sharing or giving you a glimpse of um, how law school has been for me these past few weeks. And I believe that my classmates as well as other law students would agree with me when I say that the first weeks of law school is pure adjustment. In a way that even though it's already a given fact that law school is an equalizer and that it really doesn't matter in the long run, whatever course or undergraduate degree you took. However, being a graduate of BA Broadcast Communication, which isn't really a course that you would take if you're really intending to take up law, there are a lot of terms, a lot of theories, bits and parts of the law that is taking me some time to fully grasp and fully understand. And this new book by Dean Festine is helping me in two ways. The first way is that it's providing me with my immediate need. And as a first year law school student, my immediate need is to be able to read the codal provisions in its raw text. And this book provides me that. And aside from being able to read the codal provisions of the RPC in its raw text, I am also given the opportunity to understand it faster and better because it's placed side by side with bar questions and suggested answers. So what I do is every time we're assigned with readings and on that case, a specific codal provision from the RPC is applied I go or read this new book by Dean Festine, see how the codal provision is applied in a bar question and how it is answered, and it provides me with a better explanation and gives me better understanding of how that codal provision is applied. And aside from my immediate need, this new book also provides me uh, with better leverage for bar preparation. And I know as a first year student, um, some of you might be thinking that it's too early to talk about bar preparation. However, in the College of Law of PUP, we're taught by our professors that every single hour of our classes, be it synchronous or asynchronous, it should be gearing us towards preparation on the, on, um, preparing for the bar. And this book gives us the opportunity to see as early as now how bar questions are being formulated or being placed. And at the same time, it gives us the opportunity to see how these bar questions should be answered. So it's an immediate application of what we're being taught in our classes. 
So if you're like me, where you're in the adjustment period of um, knowing how codal provisions of the RPC should be applied, and if you're um, taking some time in understanding codal provisions, then you should go ahead and buy yourself a copy of this new book by Dean Chesty. But if you're a fourth year student or a third year student preparing for um, the bar or taking the exam, then there are more reasons for you to buy this new book. Dean Festine, thank you so much for giving the students this kind of help, this kind of reference. Thank you for thinking of us when writing this book. And thank you so much for inspiring us to gear towards becoming excellent students. Once again, thank you everyone for coming to this book launch. Dean Festine, congratulations. We thank you and we're very happy for you. God bless you and we declare success on this book. And last but certainly not the least, he is a law professor of Master in Human Rights and Democratization. Let's all hear it from Attorney James Gregory A. Villasis. It's Gregory Villasis. I am a lawyer and a law lecturer. I would like to share some of my thoughts about the latest book of Dean Jem Festin on the book one of the revised penal code. Dean Festin is an authority in criminal law and his career as a dean, practicing lawyer, and an academician spanned for decades. This training and expertise are encapsulated on his latest book. In this book, Dean Festin discusses the principles of criminal law with a foresight to the bar exams. His manner of discussing these topics is most necessary for law students as they prepare for the bar examinations. And not only that, the book also gives a useful guide to law professors and reviewers as this provides them the favorite areas in the bar examinations. The book is straightforward, it is result-oriented, and reader-friendly. I congratulate and thank Dean Jim Festin for coming up with this book. Thank you very much, Dean Lina, Attorney Lardy Zabal, Ms. Modales, and Attorney Liasis. We from REC share the same level of gratitude for your trust over the years, as well as for your unrelenting service to the legal profession and to our country as a whole. We are very honored to be part of this milestone as we continue to work together to champion legal education. And now, to officially close today's event, let us hear from REC's Bookstore's General Manager for CLB Law, Mr. Reginald Soriano. Uh, pleasant good evening to everybody. Uh, my name is Reg Reggie Soriano. Uh, I represent the CLB team, which helps manage the law uh, segment of our market. And uh, first and foremost, uh, good, uh, good evening, Ms. Danda. Uh, good evening, Dean Jemmy Festin, and to our distinguished panelists. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here, to be able to somehow put a point that I, we would like to always emphasize here in Rex. Um, Rex believes in enabling each and every learner for us to empower them, to enable them to achieve their dreams. The book that we are currently launching and we are so humbled for the partnership, Dean Festine, that you have given us this honor and privilege to be part of this, uh, providing this learning solution. The book of the revised penal code of the Philippines with bar questions and suggested answers is truly a great great uh, material that has been crafted with the learner in mind in how to support them. Uh, maybe the best anecdote I can just share with everybody was that I remember my uh, father-in-law uh, when he was still uh, here with us. And during those times that I have got to sp uh, speak with him and, and have these conversations with him, I remember that one of his uh, dreams was that he was never able to take and pass the bar, um, he took it three times and unfortunately was not able to do so. Um, 
this is one of those things that we can see as a challenge for our bar practitioner or bar pass uh, for our law passers we want to be able to give them the right tools the right uh, tools that will empower them and ensure that their journey not just from passing uh, their law classes or law degrees but more importantly realizing that dream and becoming full-fledged lawyers and therefore passing the bar so with that um, we would like to, again, thank you, Dean Festine, for being part of this journey of Rex learning solutions and providing for our lifelong learners. We are so humbled again and thankful for this partnership. God bless everyone. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, Mr. Reginald Soriano. That's up, that sums up this afternoon's learning program. Indeed, it was a very productive learning afternoon with all our experts, especially Dean in behalf of Rex, I thank all of you for learning with us. Thank you. Let's all stay safe and healthy.